All right, welcome everyone. My name is Cassandra Veaton. I'm a visiting scholar in the Department of Family Medicine and Public Health here at UC San Diego, and also a scholar in residence at the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, Psychedelic Assisted Therapy, the National and Local Movement. Um, first of all, the Psychedelics and Health Research Initiative at UC San Diego is a collaboration among the departments of anesthesiology, cognitive sciences, neurosciences, psychiatry, psychology, the Center for Pain Medicine, Mindfulness, Brain and Cognition, the Qualcomm Institute, the Center for Human Frontiers, and the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. So as you can see, this is a very multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary team working on this new initiative. And what I'm going to do is introduce um, folks as I ask them questions. So I'm going to start with you, Mark. Um, Mark is Mark Geyer um, is a pioneer in this field. He's a distinguished professor of psychiatry and neurosciences emeritus at UC San Diego. He directs the neuropsychopharmacology unit at the Veterans Administration Mental Illness Research Clinical and Education Center. And he's been focusing on basic research addressing psychotic disorders and behavioral and neurobiological effects of psychedelics and other psychoactive drugs for four decades. He co-founded the Hefter Institute and recently co-founded the PHRI. So Mark, I just wanted to start by asking you maybe two questions. What got you into this, interested in this in the first place? And maybe sort of who are some of the giants we're standing on the shoulders of? Well, I brought it to the 60s, I guess, uh, I had some experience that uh, got me interested in the general area. Um, I decided to go into neurosciences instead of um, clinical medicine um, because I, I read an interesting book uh, written by Donald Hebb in 1949 about the organization of the brain. So um, I went on to um, pursue neuroscience and in the context of a degree in psychology, but started working um, in investigating the mechanisms underlying psychedelic action in 1974, really. Uh, so my first paper on the DMT metabolite was in 1975. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, funding from NIDA to study the basic mechanisms for 30 some years, uh, beginning in 81. And even through the kind of what we call the dark years, where um, no human research was really able to be done in, in the US, there were four or five labs um, that were still studying what we then called hallucinogens um, in the US, mostly with support from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And in the early 90s, um, a colleague and friend, Dave Nichols uh, at Purdue, uh, approached a few of us, expressing the concern that all of us aging hippies that were um, doing some research had no prospects of having students to follow us, and that the field was just going to wither on the vine. Um, as you know, the psychedelic field got a bad rep essentially in the late 60s um, with overzealous um, findings and interpretations of phenomena. Um, so the research was really shut down. And so we started a, the organization called the Hefter Research Institute to kind of rehabilitate psychedelic research and bring it back into the mainstream science. And that grew um, I started in 91 and 93, there was a very interesting meeting in the south of uh, Switzerland, um, where I met Albert Hoffman and mm -hmm. the Franz Bolt and Edgar Gazzullis and Hank Frank. And it was the 50th anniversary celebration of Albert's discovery of the effects of LSD, um, quietly sponsored by Sandoz Pharmaceuticals. Um, without any labels on the name tags. Um, and so I brought, uh, I started a collaboration with Franz, who was in Zurich, uh, Franz Bolenbeiter, and was 
then beginning to do human research, mostly with brain imaging. Um, so we've been working together ever since we got him to join after and um, you know talked with Albert and Albert Hoffman. And <clears throat> um, at the same time, um, Rick Doblin was starting Maps, and I'm hoping David can tell us uh, some more about that the history of that organization, which has been so important and. Uh, fostering research and applying uh, the chemicals of MDMA. So I'm not sure I addressed all your all of your questions, but yeah, thank you, Mark. That's amazing. <laughs> what an incredible story of how you got here. It's great. Well, now it's my pleasure to introduce Adam Halberstadt, who is co-director of the PHRI and an associate professor of psychiatry at UCSD. Um, he got his BA in neuroscience from University of Delaware and PhD in neurobiology from University of Pittsburgh. His postdoctoral training has been here at UCSD studying the behavioral effects of serotonergic hallucinogens. He's also received funding from NIDA, NIMH, the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, and is a member of the International Society for Serotonin Research and Neuropsychopharmacology. So Adam, um, what is it that brought you to this work yourself, both maybe personally and professionally? Well, I, I can trace it back actually to seventh grade science class. You know, this was back in around probably 1988. You know, they'd have these units on drugs. You know, it was the dare era and just say no. And you know, they would try to scare kids you know, not to use the drugs. And they were talking about LSD in one class. And, you know, how they were describing it sounded fascinating, really. I mean, that obviously wasn't what they were trying, the point they were trying to make, but just, you know, it sounded like you could take a little bit of these substances and it could really transform your perception. I thought that was a pretty, you know, neat effect. And, and I happened to ask the teacher, well, how does LSD work in the brain? And the teacher told me that nobody knew that. And, uh, you know, I was, I really was surprised by that because, it just seemed like something that someone would have tried to figure out. And so I went down to the local community college library and started trying to read, you know, about uh, hallucinogens, psychedelic drugs. And, you know, I found some books, but there wasn't a lot of stuff, but there was some journal articles. And, you know, I started reading them and I, I realized that teacher was right in one respect, which is we didn't really understand what was happening you know, in the brain to induce the experiences people had. But, there was a lot known about the receptor pharmacology. So, you know, early in the 80s, people had uh, recognized uh, that there was a receptor called serotonin to receptor for serotonin. And once they discovered it, they found that LSD, things like uh, psilocybin, bound to the receptor. And if you gave animals drugs that block the serotonin to receptor, it actually prevented uh, the animals from showing a normal behavioral response. So it really seemed like that receptor was probably the primary target for these drugs. And I really found that fascinating, just, you know, the receptor pharmacology, you know, you, you know that there's this protein and these drugs are binding to it, you can easily quantify that and study it. So it really got me interested in pharmacology. I decided to get a, try to get a, a PhD in uh, neuroscience, so I enrolled in a graduate program at UPIT. There weren't a lot of labs that were doing uh, work with psychedelics, so I ended up going in with, uh, into a lab working with serotonin itself. You know, it was a system that involved the serotonin to a receptor. And then once I got my PhD, I started looking around uh, labs to do a postdoc in. There were, you know, this was in the late 90s. There weren't a lot of labs, you know, working in the field still. But I knew that Mark, uh, Mark Geyer had been, you know, publishing for years. I'd read some of his papers, so. I sent them an email saying, hey, are you, are you guys looking for a postdoc? And it just turned, so it turned out that they were actually, they had put out an ad. I didn't even know about that. <laughs> <laughs> they ended up inviting me out for an interview. And, and then, you know, I came on to the lab as a postdoc, started working uh, doing preclinical models. And so that's how I got in the field. And eventually I, uh, you know, I started working my way up, got some grants, became a faculty member. And then, you know, we started the PHRI. So it's, you know, that's that that's the process that, that brought me here. It's amazing, kind of like a, a culmination of a scientific life dream all the way from your chemistry lab in high school. That's yeah, really yeah, cool. Exactly. Nice, nice. Um, great. Well then I'm we're just really grateful and honored to have David Bronner here as our special guest. 
He is the CEO, which stands here for Cosmic Engagement Officer of Dr. Bronner's, the top selling natural brand of soap in North America and a producer of a range of organic body care and food products. He's the grandson of Emmanuel Bronner, a fifth genera generation soap maker. And David and Michael established Dr. Bronner's as a sustainable leader in the natural products industry. I'm sure you guys have all seen it on the shelves. He's helping to lead the effort to establish regenerative organic certified standard, a step up from what's currently or called organic. One of his passions is the responsible integration of cannabis and psychedelic medicine into American and global culture. He's a board member of the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, or MAPS, and his activism embodies the company's mission, which is a commitment to making socially and environmentally responsible products and dedicating profits to help make a better world. So I'll ask you the same question, David. Um, what initially brought you to interest in psychedelics and in particular psychedelic science? Um, yeah, so I guess, um, you know, I was cutting the chase. I was, I was junior and, and I was a biology major at Harvard. Um, and I was, I was raised uh, Protestant, um, and, uh, but my dad, like my dad and my granddad, Dr. Bronner didn't have the best relationship. But my dad made sure I said the Shema in Hebrew and English, and, and my granddad's a, a somewhat uh, idiosyncratic translation of, with his universal one love mm -hmm. vision. Listen, children, eternal father, eternal one. And, uh, um, but by the time I was 13, I was like, well, God so loved the, the world why I sent his one son to this one spot, you know, like the Chinese and all the other planets and kind of lost my faith. But, uh, uh, and yes, that is Andrew Jones. That's the Harmony <laughs> Dragon uh, behind me. Um, and um, so, yeah, but in, you know, but in Harvard and biology, I was kind of getting disillusioned with the implicit materialism being downloaded that, you know, consciousness is just, um, Epiphenomena, a physical and evolutionary process, and not that big a deal. Um, and you know, I was like, oh, well, you know, I think there's probably more to the picture here. And, um, and uh, yeah, getting discontent with the lecture format, period. You know, there's non interactive lecture formats, it's like ridiculous. So I was spending a lot of time with my friends smoking cannabis, retired from alcohol culture, realizing how much better cannabis was to like mm -hmm. vibrate in a way higher way, with music and friends going deep. And it was a mushroom chocolate that my friend gave me in my junior year. And I remember just looking down at my arm and I'm like, you know, what does it mean at like a quantum level? Um, there's no difference between me and the universe. It's just like one mm. continuum of energy. And when I eat and I poop, the, the world's pouring into me, the, the, you know, the water, the energy, the food, you know, and I'm not even the same stuff like month mm. to month. I'm just a, like a river of energy and one and continuum with living reality. And, like this mm -hmm. first unity experience of like that, you know, the, the, you know, the, the identification of self with like a much larger reality process, and you know, like the, the you know much more mysterious living world that we're all embedded in, and you know, we live and we die, and this is way bigger life surging for us. And I would say that that was, you know, and then <clears throat> you know, then many, many, many more amazing mm -hmm. of experiences. But I would say that. Uh, you know, that really opened me up to the truth that my granddad has been holding and dedicated his life to that there is love and light at the heart of our reality and that uh, in spite of all the suffering and absurdity and that um, when faith traditions aren't uh, making idols out of the beliefs and demonizing each other, they're, they're pointing at that transcendent mystery. And, mm. um, so yeah, and, and you know, basically had, I was in Amsterdam when I had some really, really big experiences that, We'll, we'll go super deep into that, but um, but realize that the drug war was in large part a religious war and a sacraments of our people. That mm. are, you know, this is so backwards. Here's like these these allies that can help open us up and make us tap us into our deeper, more authentic selves, more connected to each other, to the world, to nature, awaken conscience, and and realizing that this is that the drug war was a proxy to go after the counterculture and mm. generation that had dropped out of the war machine. And, rebelled and before that was a proxy to go after people of color and Mexican and black American. Mm. Um, so yeah, so I think that was just became, you know, just in my own experience, like crucial to end the drug war and integrate mm. 
psychedelic and cannabis as, as fast as possible. Yeah. Wow, awesome. Thanks, David. Um, I'll start with you too, just because we are really in a psychedelic renaissance. And, you know, what do you attribute that to, number one? And number two, where do you think we are right now in this, with the science of <laughs> understanding the p potential clinical benefits? Yeah. Well, I mean, we're in a great moment. We're in a huge inflection point um, and shift. And um, I mean, I think it's like the hard work of uh, obviously the o our OG uh, godfathers and godmothers of the movement doing all the amazing work and holding the torch through the dark days. Uh, and, you know, until it could flare forth again and uh, incubate a new generation of scientists once the, you know, political ice started to thaw. Um, and, uh, you know, cultural factors like Grateful Dead and hip hop culture and whatever keeping mm -hmm. people alive there. Um, uh, but um, I think, uh, yeah, definitely um, Rick Goblin and MAPS and his, you know, founding MAPS the day that DEA scheduled MDMA, you know, he was part of this underground therapeutic community who was having great success for, with what they called Adam at the mm -hmm. time as an adjunct to, to therapy and, um, and it was this amazing tool. And, um, and when DEA scheduled in 84, Rick founded MAPS and just dedicated his life to to moving uh, MDMA through FDA approval process, wrote his doctor's thesis at Government Kennedy School on doing exactly that, and now he's basically almost done it. Um, and uh, you know, getting like the first studies authorized, FDA approved. I mean, just you know, he's kind of like I'll say he's like Obi Wan Kenobi on the Death Star, like just uh, moving the 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 system and getting approval where you know, you know, even in the dark days of the drug war. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's all the amazing results out of all these MDMA assisted therapy trials for PTSD and then on the South side and side, just the incredible results in John Hopkins and NYU and UCLA mm. on, on treatment resistant depression and end of life anxiety and addiction. Um, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, to the point that FDA has granted breakthrough designation, that's massive. Uh, Michael Pollan's book, well, first is cover story in New Yorker, trip treatment, and then how to change your mind. Um, and, and those are cultural watersheds and Tim Ferriss being really honest and open mm -hmm. and deep trauma and healing and, and support of psychedelic therapy in a lot of different ways. And um, yeah, uh, I think all that together and maybe just people, you know, we're just moving far enough away from the sixties and the, that, that whole split, not that the country is not split in fundamental other ways, but mm -hmm. psychedelics and cannabis aren't proxies for that anymore or, or increasingly less. And um, yeah, now of course with the elections, uh, you know, we just ran the tables on drug policy. Well, cannabis, of course, I mean, mm -hmm. I'd say that cannabis really paved the way. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I mean, just this election, we, we won on cannabis front, we won in Montana. South Dakota and Mississippi, you know, mm -hmm. the states, so showing it's bipartisan now. Mm. And, um, and then in Oregon, we went, ran, we won on both South Seven Therapy, which is a really important measure where Thomas Schrecker, our therapist, or husband wife team, and a vision of bringing South Seven into a therapeutic model outside mm. of the pharma model, um, so we can access it like you would therapy. Um, but you know, with but replicating the rigor of what John Hopkins and Mm -hmm. and those those models of the therapeutic setting and making sure facilitators are well trained and, um you know you have proper preparation proper facilitation people can really release in their experience and um and then uh and then integration after um and i feel like that model really replicates the indigenous ceremonial container uh mm -hmm. for, for the medicine to really optimize the experience um but yeah winning that winning broad-based decrim treatment on jail in Oregon as well, which is, you know, even for heroin, it's like, you no, know, there's no point arresting addicts. That's not helping them mm -hmm. get them the help they need and with more treatment. And then we have psilocybin therapy being introduced alongside that. Mm -hmm. um, it's perfect. DC, we won 76% of the vote on a decrim nature effort, um, you know, falling on Denver and Oakland and Santa Cruz, and Ann Arbor. So yeah, it's all like, yeah, now it's, a, now it's just an avalanche. So I'm sure there's other crucial factors, but 
Now, that was a great overview. Yeah, I was thinking to myself yesterday, we had a meeting with a couple of the people who are working on training the monitors for the actual sessions that we'll be doing here at the PHRI at UCSD. And right before the meeting, I thought, wow, if I could talk to myself in graduate school 25 years ago, and if I told myself I was about to go into a meeting to set up the monitoring for the psilocybin sessions at a major university, I would have thought, wow, we did it. You yeah. know, amazing. Yeah. Um, but it's really been due to the hard work and courage of people like you, Mark. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your work on psychedelics here at UCSD and, and kind of what you see it as being ahead for the Psychedelics and Health Research Initiative? Sure. Well, it's really exciting for me to um, be able for us to move into human research here. Um, as I mentioned, I, through you know, four decades, really, I, I worked in basic mechanisms of neuroscience and neurobiology and pharmacology in animals, but I collaborated with Franz Bollenweider because he was working in humans, and um, so I was able to do some parallel studies still on mechanisms and um, brain mechanisms and not clinical applications. Um, and Cassie, like your experience, imagining that when you were in graduate school that you'd be thinking in, about actively training monitors for a clinical study of psilocybin. I couldn't have imagined that. So I, I had 30 some years of funding from NIDA on hallucinogens, but you know we were working with the Hafter Institute to try to um, break through the Schedule One barrier. I mean, our, our strategy was to get some Schedule One compound, um, a psychedelic, approved for human use to break the Schedule One barrier. Uh, and only then would we find out you know, what these things are good for. And you know, we've all been skeptical. Um, if we're trained as scientists, be skeptical. But I'm amazed at how this renaissance has uh, happened so quickly. Um, sure didn't seem quick through all those decades of, of struggling. And, um, but, you know, for, it was only like six or seven years ago that I was felt comfortable mentioning the Hefter mm -hmm. research in, in my academic community. So I didn't put Hefter on my uh, academic CV, my curriculum CV. Um, it was like we're in the closet. And to be able to have these kind of discussions publicly um, is really refreshing. Um, so it's exciting that we have this opportunity um, to do what Johns Hopkins and NYU and um, the people in Europe have been able to do, um, which is study these compounds in humans. And in particular now, uh, given the amazingly promising data so far on the therapeutic efficacy of uh, psilocybin and MDMA and the treatment of PTSD, um, we're able to conceptualize the study that we're launching now, which is to see whether um, psilocybin, a one dose or two dose experience with psilocybin, can um, attenuate the protracted and untreatable so far intractable pain of phantom limb pain. Um, obviously, there's an opioid crisis and opioids aren't very good, almost useless in the treatment of phantom limb pain. And it's a horrible problem. Um, of course, here with our VA system and our military, we, I've done a lot of work with uh, the Marine Corps and looking at PTSD and TBI. We have too many um, warriors who are struggling with um, phantom limb pain, and there's really no effective treatment for it. So, if this works, uh, it will really uh, um, be gratifying and will be uh, a major step forward. And there are other pain syndromes that are not responsive to opioids and may be responsive to this kind of rebooting that we think happens. Uh, these uh, transformative experiences with psychedelics. Mm. 
Yeah, great. Um, Adam, maybe you could talk a little bit more about the plans at PHRI and um, what we actually have on the books and then what kinds of things are we hoping to do next? Oh, sure. Uh, so we, you know, Mark and I had been working for many years, you know, trying to get human studies going at UCSD. You know, we started talking to other faculty members and uh, you know, there was actually a good amount of interest in, in conducting these types of studies. So we set up the uh, PHRI. And then the, the question became, you know, what, what should we focus on for the first indication? Because there's, there's a range of possibilities. And we, we sort of narrowed down phantom pain uh, because actually one of the PHRI members was an amputee and he had actually had a pretty intractable phantom pain. But after taking psilocybin at a high dose on a few occasions, he actually went for remission. And that's pretty remarkable because phantom pain just does not usually get better spontaneously. It's an horribly intractable illness and people really suffer. So that was sort of eye-opening to hear that account. And we started looking through the literature and we found some case reports uh, from Japan in the 1960s, where they'd given uh, six amputees LSD, uh, not a high dose, so 50 micrograms. So, you know, it would, you would notice the effects, but you wouldn't be tripping really, really hard. So they did that twice, and four of the six amputees, uh, the phantom pain went away and didn't come back. The other, uh, the other two, they didn't get complete release, but they did have a you know, reduction in pain. That's just a remarkable effect. And so if, if you know if you could potentially replicate that with psilocybin, it, it would really improve people's lives. And so we started thinking that that would be a great indication. I mean, for one thing, you know, it's likely you could, you could detect an effect that it's there. So the control group probably isn't gonna get a lot better. And so if psilocybin is effective for phantom pain, we'll probably be able to, to detect it. But more importantly, I think this is an indication where we have the potential to really change people's lives. If we can really reduce pain, that, that's really amazing because these patients are really underserved by, uh, by modern medicine right now. And it's not really helping them. Mm. And so there's the potential to rip there to really make a difference. And so we really you know, decided that that's a good indication for our first study. But what we're really trying to do is set up an infrastructure that would allow us to look at a, a range of indications. So mm. we're getting the study set up now, but We'll have the monitors, the procedures in place. Once we do that for the one study, then we can start looking at other indications. And we're definitely planning to look at a few different indications. So that's you know, something that we're looking at over the long term. And so we have this one study, study we're getting set up now, but we're hoping to have you know, a few other ones in the near future. And mm -hmm. we really have the capabilities to do that too. That's great, that's great. Um, for those of you who are on the line, um, please um, feel free to ask a question in the Q&A box. Um, you can either chat it in or you can use the Q&A box and let us know if you have any questions and then we'll um, leave some time for Q&A. Um, so one of the interesting questions I, I have wrestled with over my time as a researcher um, doing a couple of decades of consciousness studies, which I'd love you guys to weigh in on, is you know, to what extent do you think the effects of psychedelics so far, as we're looking at them scientifically and even anthropologically, they obviously have biological effects, and then they obviously have effects on people's point of view or perspective or their consciousness. Do you think these things are kind of inextricably intertwined, or do you think that um, there's going to be you know, what's your theory, Adam, about the effect? Do you think that there's a specific biological effect that happens? Is there something that happens in people's psyches? Is it both? Um, what do you think? Well, I'm not sure if we can really separate the two things. I mean, ultimately, if you're taking a drug, it's changing biology, that's changing your perception, but you know, that's still biology right there. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure, you know, it's, there, it's really a duality, and I'm not sure mm -hmm. you can separate it. Now, there, there is a lot of thinking that maybe you could have therapeutic effects in the absence of subjective effects, and mm -hmm. that may be true in some cases, but I mean, it's, it's a hard question to really address unless mm -hmm. you come up with new compounds, because the ones that we have, you know, they're, they're definitely psychoactive, and so it's, gonna be, it's hard to really, you know, separate the two effects. So if you're producing subjective effects, you're producing you know, the underlying biological effects, too. 
So in some ways, it's it's, it's going to be something that's really hard to uh, tease apart. But it's you know a lot of a lot of the effects that subjectively may be linked to things like glutamate release, but that's a biochemical effect, and you know if, 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 and that's been linked to some of the, uh, the biochemical changes and neuroplasticity, but if you're, you know, if you're not driving glutamate release, then you're probably not having experience. Mm -hmm. So it, ultimately, it, you know, it may, there may not really be a difference between the two viewpoints. It's mm -hmm. not that you can separate the biology and, and the experiential aspects of it. Yeah, and Mark, what are your thoughts? You know, I know that in the team, we've talked a little bit about this concept of um, and I just saw an article come out today about um, resetting the brain, that somehow the compounds allow for some massive temporary neuroplasticity that reorganizes things. Yeah, the metaphor is like rebooting your computer. And, you know, con conceptually, I'm pretty comfortable with that notion, but it doesn't satisfy me as an explanation. In other words, mm -hmm. it's not very concrete as an explanation. It's a nice metaphor, and I, I do think that something going on. I don't, I mean, some people use the notion of catharsis, mm. uh, and that may be uh, a subset of this kind of rebooting notion, but, but I guess I, I think of it more broadly than uh, a cathartic um, phenomenon. Um, because it's not necessarily dealing with, with an issue that for which one needs catharsis. Um, you know, I've known a number of people and witnessed a number of people um, really change their way of thinking about something or the way they're thinking about themselves or the perceptions of the world or perceptions of politics or whatever. Um, it, it can really open your eyes. Um, all the stuff we refer to it. Um, one of the people I read in college that it influenced me a lot, both philosophically um, and in terms of my interest in, in these uh, pharmacological phenomena, but he broadened it to religious and ecstatic phenomena as well. Mm. Um, opening the door to perception allows you to, to see things anew. Mm. That's one of the reasons I started to study habituation. Um, if there's anything these psychedelics do, is to obliterate things to which you have become habituated and mm. see things with a child's eye, uh, with, with a newness. And you know, that's reflective of essentially what I think of as the rebooting. Mm. Um, David, what about you? What do you think about sort of... Um, how it works. And then I'll also bring in a question from our audience about whether you think there's a, a difference between the synthetic versus the natural versions of some of these compounds. Um, yeah, well, I think, um, I think it, you know, it depends on what medicine we're talking about. Um, I think when we're talking about psilocybin, um, you know, Michael Pollan's popularized the default mode network and taking that offline and allowing other regions of the brain to talk to each other um, and, and, um, and allowing like would say a different s sense of self to arise that mimics maybe deep meditative states. Um, but I think to Mark's point, I think that, I mean, uh, Roland Griffiths at John Hopkins often says that uh, like the therapeutic effect is cor strongly correlated to the mystical experience. Mm -hmm. So like the more profound and deep the experience um, then the, the better the therapeutic outcome in general. Um, I mean, for something like tumor resistant depression or, or smoking cessation, I mean, some for final limb pain. I, I mean, I, I mean, it may well, it may be interesting to see what you guys find. Um, it may well still be a correlated um, deal. And then MDMA is, um, you, you know, tamps down the amygdala, the fear or the most fear center of the brain, tamps that down. I remember doc, uh, Dr. Rockefeller, Jay Rockefeller, he, he made a real good case to my family about the, the mechanism that it's tamping down the fear response so you can mm. deal with really traumatic experience without re-traumatizing 
it, it opens up that sweet spot between uh, mm. hypo, hyper and hypo uh, reactivity or, you know, where you're either just way too aroused or you're not, or, bit, or flatlined um, and able to deal with and process really difficult experience. And the amphetamine part of it just allows you to really get in there and really do some amazing work. But, you know, but subjectively, obviously, it's ultimately helping the therapeutic, the self-healer. I mean, a big part of this is like the, the, we have an inner self that can heal psychically, emotionally, in the same way our physical body will heal if we mm. in the right conditions. So I think it's still, you know, very much allowing a, an internal process, you know, therapeutic, subjective process to unfold and do really difficult, traumatic, emotional stuff to be worked through and then consult, reconsolidate it in case any may in a normal memory structure that's not re-traumatizing or really messing up your life. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, accompanied by this um, also incredible sense of awe and wonder and beauty and, you know, there can be new eyes on difficult situations, but also new eyes on the incredible, exquisite beauty of the world and mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah. And it seems like those things might be um, just as helpful to easing depression and things like that. Well, I'll go to some questions from the audience. So um, one person asked, um, if somebody is very interested in getting involved in psychedelic research and therapy, they have a bachelor's degree now in psychology, what could they do next to get involved? Is the only route to getting into this field a master's or a PhD? Does anyone want to address that? Um, yeah, I can, I can address that. It, it depends on what level of involvement you would like. If, if you just want to be involved in studies and you can just volunteer, uh, you know, if, if you want, you could be a technician for studies. That that would be fine with a BA or a BS. Um, if you want to be more, uh, you know, directing the studies or a PI, I mean, you're definitely going to need an advanced degree, you know, a master's degree, but especially a PhD or an MD. But it's you know, there's plenty of different levels of involvement that you could, you know, that you could take, and it, it really depends on what you want to do. But if you, you, I'd encourage you to, you know, just contact the lab and try to get involved that way. And if you want to be more on the, you know, the PI side of things, then you, you probably need to go to graduate school and medical school. Mm. Thanks, Adam. Uh, someone else wrote in, it looks like um, MDMA, psilocybin, and ketamine are the main compounds re being researched now but they were wondering what you guys think about the future of LSD research and will we be seeing more of a return to that or more inclusion of that in the future? Well, I suspect we will. Um, Hester has already begun to fund uh, the first LSD um, clinical research in the US. Uh, there are a couple of studies ongoing in Europe, in Switzerland in particular. LSD had a continued um, clinical application. It was not shut down in uh, the 60s as it was mm -hmm. in the US. Um, so there was a, a psychiatric community called the Psycholytic Society that used LSD therapeutically um, straight through from the 60s up till actually about 1993 um, meeting uh, that I mentioned in, in the south of Switzerland in Agno, uh, when Essentially, the Swiss government sort of shut down the psycholytic society um, therapeutic use until they could demonstrate more empirically that there was efficacy. So it began to then to raise the standard for uh, utilization of LSD and other compounds in therapeutic settings. Um, it still did a little bit of the psycholytic society work uh, therapies ongoing in Switzerland despite that attempt for the government to intervene. But um, LSD is a little more difficult. I mean, we chose psilocybin for most of the early work for practical reasons. That, uh, mostly the, the duration of action is mo much more convenient. Um, I, as you can imagine, we didn't have a whole lot of money to do the, the research that we were doing. Um, 
And with LSE, you really need to monitor the subject overnight, preferably. Um, psilocybin is a shorter action, so you can have somebody come in, um, have an experience, um, gather data, or have a therapeutic intervention, um, and have them go home the same day. With LSE, that's a little less uh, practical. So it's really a, and, and there was a lot of uh, historical experience with psilocybin. Sandoz had actually marketed it and done toxicology studies a long time before us. So we didn't have to worry about that. There are thousands and thousands of people who had either mushrooms or pure synthetic uh, psilocybin. So there was very little risk involved. Um, and, and that and duration of action and you know, it's just a wide uh, level of experience, human experience with the compound made it the, the compound of choice. There's no reason to believe that this is the best compound um, for the therapeutic efficacy. Um, and there are certainly companies and research laboratories now using our basic knowledge of the pharmacology of these compounds to try to identify better or different or variations on the theme. It's just like we don't have one antidepressant in the world. We have a whole bunch of them. Where we don't have just one antipsychotic. We have 20 or 30. So what we've done, I think, is at least we hope uh, set the stage for more research to refine this technology, uh, this therapeutic technology. Um, we chose the easy path by choosing psilocybin, but there are going to be a lot of other compounds with different flavors um, for different applications. Mm. Thank you. I'm going to try to combine a few of these questions here, and maybe David could start on this one, which is um, your perspective on decriminalization versus legalization and um, the fact that cannabis legalization at various levels has opened people's minds. Do you think that we'll have consumer products with micro doses of psilocybin available soon? Oh, you're muted, David, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, we support, um, you know, all approaches. <clears throat> I think um, decriminalization is, uh, I mean, it's politically easier and incremental and fully support that. Um, and, uh, you know, mushrooms or something you can grow in your house. Um, I mean, I guess decriminalization, legalization, I mean, it, it, sometimes the, the line gets a little fuzzy because I think decriminalization means maybe it remains illegal at some amount, but at a certain amount it's not. Um, I guess it could also mean lack of regulation versus regulation. Um, uh, so, I mean, I would say that, um, you know, regulated, regulated markets like are, I mean, you need them for, for purity, for quality, standardized, um, you know, I mean, Cannabis benefited highly from regulation, so you're not eating some unknown potent edible, getting blasted for the day. Um, uh, so I think there's real benefit to that, um, but you also wanna make sure you're not raising prices and overtaxing. You know, marijuana right now is like so overtaxed that it's, um, you know, this is a huge black market. Um, so, but I think incrementally decriminalization uh, as a baseline leading to uh, legalization or more regulated avenues. Um, certainly, I think mushrooms eventually will be pretty widely available. Mm. But I think first and foremost to really introduce them to the culture in this therapeutic context that well, I fully support and partake myself in using mushrooms at home or out in the woods or at a concert that, you know, it's a night and day experience when it's a high dose therapeutic session where you're just fully released and don't need to worry about being distracted and, mm. and that, you know, and that real intention. And like I said, like it's like the analog of the ceremonial container. Mm. I think that's really important, like decriminalization and then that therapeutic model and then like, you know, go to a dispensary model eventually when the culture is mm. properly educated and knows how to handle these medicines and we're, you know, not doing crazy stuff. 
No. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Another question yeah. for Adam and Mark. Um, maybe we can combine a couple of questions here too. Is in what way has the preclinical work you've done contributed to your understanding of the therapeutic potential of these compounds? And what is the status of the phantom limb pain study? What are the next steps? Uh, that's a great question, I think. Uh, so it's, you know, it, it's given us insight into the, the likely receptor mechanisms for the therapeutic effects and that I think it's really kind of pulling us in directions, not, not maybe as much with the existing compounds, but, you know, there's a whole range of drug development going on looking for new compounds. And so I think, you know, the search for what are called functionally selected compounds, which are compounds that bind to a receptor, but don't necessarily induce the entire range of downstream signaling responses. So you can kind of fine tune, you know, what's happening in the cells where the receptors are activated. You can look at uh, things like selectivity for different receptors. So a lot of a lot of these uh, uh, psychedelic drugs like psilocybin bind to a whole range of receptors. And, you know, serotonin 2A is the primary one that, that does things we're interested in, but you know, there's it's also binding to all these other sites that are producing effects. And not all, all of those effects may be totally benign. So some of them may be blocking some of the, some of the effects. So you can actually be dampening down your you know therapeutic response because the drugs are blocking the serotonin 1A receptor or you know it could be binding to a serotonin 2A, 2C receptor and inducing anxiety. So by really cataloging those interactions you can then go and try to design new molecules which are more optimized, more targeted, you know potentially have less side effects but you know more marked uh, um, therapeutic effects you can try to uh, you know, alter the time course, so you can really sort of, you know, optimize the ther therapeutic effects from these compounds. I think that's really, you know, where all these all the preclinical work has kind of, you know, helped us along to try to make better therapeutic molecules. Great. Yeah. And then in terms of the phantom limb pain study, um, we're making substantial progress on funding. And we are um, in the midst of receiving all kinds of federal approvals and jumping through major hoops. And Adam, you think we'll, and Mark will probably be able to get started on the study um, early next year if all goes as planned. Yeah, we're, we're, in, we're aiming for, um, you know, the spring to start enrolling people. And then hopefully by midsummer, that's when we're trying to like, uh, have the first uh, drug sessions. So in less than a year, I think we'll be up and running. And you know, there's a lot of hoops to jump through in terms of DEA approval and uh, FDA, you know, the IND approval. But we're toward the end of that process, and so you know, we're gearing up to start working. So you know, sooner sooner rather than later, we can start enrolling uh, patients and you know, seeing if there's a, a therapeutic effect. So it's really exciting. We're really you know, starting to jump into the, the really the really fun part. Thank you. Um, there was a very interesting question. Um, do any of the panelists have hypotheses regarding people who don't experience visual phenomena during psychedelic experiences? Yeah, so I, I would have the question, do you have question. other experiences, but you know, <laughs> yeah, non-visual psychedelic experiences? I don't have an explanation for that. I don't know. Yeah, I knew somebody who, who was claimed that they didn't have visual effects from LSD. I always wondered whether it was some kind of receptor expression thing, or maybe they have, you know, uh, some, you know, some differences in receptor structure or something, but it's, it's really hard to, you know, know, because there's a huge number of things that could potentially cause that to happen. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, so since this is co-hosted by the Clark Center, maybe we'll start with you, David, and ask, we like to think about the future. And so if you were to lay out one or two hopes for where the field might be, let's say in 2030, what would they be? Yeah, well, I, uh, I would hope that um, pretty much all psychedelic medicines have been uh, thoroughly um, researched for all possible conditions and people are free to avail themselves. Uh, of them uh, for those conditions, but then for personal growth, 
Um, just we're all struggling with the dilemmas of life. And, uh, you know, basically being able to choose. Um, and, uh, you know, and then outside the therapeutic context, have, um, you know, ceremony, religious use, um, personal use, and hopefully we're all, we're a psychedelically open global citizenry that's enacting much more compassionate policies and being mm. more rad and collective behavior change is gonna help us from driving over a climate change cliff and uh, income inequality will be, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll address all the massive social and environmental problems. I don't know, 2030 might be a little soon. <laughs> so maybe, maybe like 2050, but anyways, um, yeah, I think they, these have such amazing power to help so many people and yeah, just <clears throat> it flourishes as well, yeah. Yeah, and you bring up this important point that um, it's not only about um, easing individual pain or therapeutic purposes for individuals, but often people have experiences during these sessions where they experience self-transcendence or interconnection with other people, other beings, the planet, and it becomes pretty difficult afterwards for them to engage in behaviors that benefit themselves but harm others or harm the environment. And so, you know, those are some other research questions I think are worth investigating. Adam, how about you? Where do you see things and or where would you like them to be in, in 10 or 20 years from now? Well, I think that psilocybin will be approved uh, you know, in the next 10 years. I think that's reasonable. There's the way things are going, it seems like, you know, it'll be approved for some indication, maybe depression or anxiety. So, you know, that, that seems rather likely. And then I'm guessing that drug companies will start producing other molecules and they'll start testing them. But I think we have a little bit longer to go until other compounds are approved just because we're still so early in the process. I mean, the lead mm -hmm. candidate are just being identified right now and you know in a lot of cases the, the work is just starting so i'd say maybe 20 years down the road there may be other compounds that are available you know between 10 and 20 and then after that it's you know the way things are going it's, it's hard to predict <laughs> any longer than that but i would definitely think that psilocybin will probably be coming through med medication you know that's mm -hmm. probably the first major change we'll see great and Mark, what about you interject that there's those of us have been um, waging this war for several decades now to try to gain acceptance of the, of the science and the clinical implications of it have concerns about how much enthusiasm there is right now it's wonderful to see but it's a little scary in the sense that several of us went through this in the 60s where there was enthusiasm rampant enthusiasm um, and a lot of uncontrolled plant studies and over-the-top claims. Um, so there, most of us who are, have been in this field for a long time are concerned less people run off and do things too soon, too fast, try to move it too quickly and um, Problems happen. These are not toys. These, mm -hmm. these drugs are powerful agents. Um, this is, you know, the old saying, don't try this at home. Um, there are attendant dangers to this uh, public zeal and, and enthusiasm. And we could see this shut down, you know, in two years and we not get to the 10 year or 20 year dreams that we can imagine. So most of us. Uh, who were burned in the 60s by Tim Leary's enthusiasm, um, wanted to go caref carefully and cautiously. Um, and not just because FDA is working as a gatekeeper to uh, the clinical applications, but because weak science is, is risky and these compounds aren't good for everybody. Um, so I, I, I really think it, you know, a word of warning, um, is that we want to have it done carefully, thoughtfully, using rigorous scientific procedures. We only got this far because Hefter insisted on being holier than the Pope. Mm. The ex 
director of the NIMH at the Psychedelic Sciences meeting. Uh, Tom Insel, when he was said, congratulating us on the MDMA progress, but said there, he, you know, with 3,000 people there, he said, be careful. One bad episode, and there will be people who shut you down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the we're not ready to have um, any therapist start applying these therapies using these drugs and therapy. There are already uh, very serious plans for training therapists in the use of these compounds uh, clinically. Uh, the, ther the notion is that therapists will be trained and licensed for a specific form of psychedelic therapy, and only licensed therapists will be able to use it. You're not going to get a 30-day supply of psilocybin pills to take home. Um, that that would probably be a mistake, um, and that practice, if it were to start, would not last for very long. Now, the area where that's most likely to be a lot of pressure toward moving in that kind of a distribution pattern is the notion of microdosing, mm. um, where people are not taking what would be called psychedelic doses, um, not having transcendent transformative peak experiences that they will rate as the most impressive, you know, among the top five events of their life, as some of the patient the subjects in the Golden Griffiths studies have uh, noted. Um, microdosing is, you know, different things for different people. There are a lot of beliefs in it. There's almost zero science supporting mm -hmm. um, the efficacy. And frankly, it's going to be very difficult to separate placebo effects, mm. expectation effects, from microdosing effects. Because different people make different claims about what the benefit of the microdosing is. Um, but I think the, the enthusiasm about microdosing is one area where it's going to be, there could be a lot of pressure on the system, if you want to call it the system, social system to have some of these compounds a, a more freely available, but you know, there are attendant risks um, in that. We don't want to lose the baby with the bathwater in a sense. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a really good overview of some of the complexities here. Well, we're wrapping up the hour, and I really want to thank David Bronner for coming to be our special guest. Really appreciate you being here and appreciate all the work that you have done in this domain to support the field. Um, also, thank you, Mark and Adam. And for those of you who are part of the UCSD community on the call, know that we will be um, beginning to build a more um, robust community here at UCSD around psychedelic science in the coming years. Um, so please stay in touch with us. Also check out the Clark Center for Human Imagination. There will be some opportunities for um, volunteering and student researchers, so please reach out to us if you're interested. And um, David, did you want to have any final comment before we close down? Um, sure. Well, I, I guess responding to Mark, uh, you know, uh, points well taken. Uh, um, I would say, though, the moment we're in compared to the 60s, and that, you know, I think like what we're doing with, you know, what Rick's doing and, and with MDMA and, and, and the care, all the care that Hefter and big shout out to Hefter for all their amazing work. Um, but that the measures like, like in Oregon, it's a therapeutic model and even the decriminalization models are pretty much in a healing therapeutic frame. And it's, and it's very much a, um, you know, turn, tune in, turn on, you know, drop in kind of model like it's all very pro-social and i don't, I, don't yeah, I mean uh obviously the worst case scenarios can can unfold you know Ro roland definitely gets worried about someone running out of the treatment center or some some plan whatever and you know, car runs over but uh you know but i mean i think the harms of prohibition are, are much greater than a properly educated uh informed populace and i think that's happening uh, MAPS has a Zendo project. It's all about psychedelic harmony. Mm -hmm. 
ever, ever more crucial to expand that and inform, informs first responders how to engage with people who are experiencing, uh, you know, not the best episodes and, you know, and, and being smart about it. But all in all, I think, I think we're going to, we're going to do this and, uh, and it's going to happen. It's going to go pretty good. I mean, extremely well, it's going to go extremely well. And, um, yeah, I can't wait till you guys do a trial down there at UCSD that, uh, I don't know, maybe not have a, you know, there's the religious professionals one, but maybe you could do uh, manufacturing CEOs or something and see, uh, see the before and after effects. There you go. I love it. That's great. Well, thanks everyone for being with us. We really appreciate it. And we'll look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.